Now comes Leonard Cohen with an even more sensational account of a young man's adventures in Montreal. First, let's review his book, and then we'll meet the author. If we lived in Paris, London, or New York, we would probably have grown up used to novels mentioning familiar streets and landscapes. But living as we do in a city that is not often a setting for fiction, we are at a slight disadvantage, or is it an advantage, when reading Leonard Cohen's The Favorite Game. Then, too, we are young in Montreal, and so the book, about youth in Montreal, strikes us all the more strongly. Perhaps we are so inclined to say, yes, it's like that there, or so he felt that way too, that we are unwilling to ask whether this is a good book or whether the book is saying what it says well. There's an old wives' tale, or perhaps it's an old critic's tale, about first novels, especially by young poets. It seems, goes the theory, that authors often have to get all their traumas out on paper before they can settle down to writing of emotions and of other people. The favorite game has had all these things said about it. Whether or not the book is actually autobiographical is beside the point. The point is that this book has the flaws and virtues of a diary, shuffled, selected, and rearranged by the poet. The image of memory, which recurs in the novel, is of a motion picture being screened in the author's mind. It seems that Leonard Cohen has done, done with his experiences and memories what a director does with film. He is exposed a great deal tried to photograph everything, and then done the cutting, splicing, and forming before giving the work to the public. This method has many advantages. It tells us a great deal about Cohen as camera, the man, and about Cohen as director, the author. It shows an older generation a great deal that is true and perhaps shocking about their sons and daughters. It tells young people much about themselves. It tells the world about Montreal, Canada, and a new generation's attitudes towards speed, God, love, mothers, sex, and life. The method also has certain disadvantages. Sometimes real blood looks phonier than ketchup. There are just too many cliches in life to make all parts of all diaries good reading. At times, a great documentary is less creative than a bad Western. So, as the critics have said, and will continue to say, Leonard Cohen has gotten that first novel off his chest, out of his system, and so forth. He can now, they sagely prophesy, go on to write major works. We can afford to be less concerned with those future masterpieces than with this present book, this bitter, brilliant, hopeful story about our city, our youth, and our lives. And we can be interested in Leonard Cohen, not as the old master the critics hope he will become, but as the vital, intelligent young man we meet now, talking with Stuart. Thank you, Patty. Well, then, you've heard uh, one person's opinion about your book. Do you think this is something you had to get off your chest, as the review said? Yes, I think it was something I had to get off my chest, but not in the sense that I was uh, taking off a, uh, uh, a hair shirt. You know, it wasn't the kind of thing I just discarded uh, because I wanted to be able to uh, go to bed easier at night. Well, I want to go to bed easier at night, too, but that's another problem. No, I wrote that. And uh, it's, it's really a third novel disguised as a first novel, and all the reviewers, as to be expected, fell for it. Because in Canada, people really can't accept the fact that anything good comes out of their neighbor's house. Uh, this is a particular Canadian failing. I'm not saying that this is good. I think it's good, but I'm, I'm not trying to be evangelical about it. I mean, the kind of reviewing, the attitude of the reviewers is a kind of head-patting review. You know, this is very good. This is his first novel. But in America, where they don't know that I'm a poet, they don't know it's my first novel, they don't know anything about it except it's a book between hard covers, the reviews have been much more objective and much less patronizing. It's a third novel, I promise you, uh, future generations of readers and PhD students. It's a third novel disguised as a first novel, and it's uh, very highly crafted and very highly disciplined. And everything I want to say is there. It's not just that first fine, careless frenzy. Well, now, the uh, point of it being autobiographical or not being autobiographical, I imagine it must be approached uh, three times a day uh, with meals uh, to be asked whether this is really you or whether your friends have been deliberately included or excluded. Well, if it came with meals, I would be a lot happier. Actually, it generally comes with a lot of hostility. Uh, look, 
the emotion is autobiographical because the only person's emotions I know about are my own. Uh, the, in, the incidents are not autobiographical. I, I, I apologize. I'm terribly sorry. I cringe before the tyranny of fact, but it is not autobiographical. I made it up out of my little head. <laughs> well, now, the uh, man who you depict as your hero, uh, Briefman, in the book... A miserable uh, guy. I wondered about that. I was going to ask you whether you really uh, could identify with him, whether you thought he was uh, a strong character or a terribly weak one. I don't mind him. I don't mind him. I wouldn't mind having uh, a talk or two with him. I wouldn't like to be him. Mm -hmm. I'm not him. He's someone I created to express a certain kind of feeling about my generation, about myself, and most especially about this city, about Montreal. Mm -hmm. I think he's an honest person. I think the things that happened to him, the obscenities involved with God, the women he went to bed with, the people he hurt, the people he wanted to love, the things he saw are the things that happened to everybody. And the people who have uh, criticized the book for obscenity or for uh, um, a kind of disgusting exposure are people who have not looked honestly into their own lives and who want to read about things which are not true. And my book, book may be lousy, but it's true. Well, now, you send your hero to New York, and yeah. uh, he doesn't seem to fare any better there, even though the critics may be better down there. Oh, no, no, because, uh, because Breveman, my, my character, uh, is, uh, is not going to fare very well anywhere, and that's his charm. The point is that he's, uh, that he's a kind of brilliant failure, and uh, I think that's, that's a good thing for anybody to be as a brilliant failure. I can't stand success. It's obscene. Now, do you think that the uh, people who are reviewing your book here and uh, suggesting that it's not too bad for a young fellow, particularly someone from Montreal and all other such uh, very annoying phrases, uh, do you think that these people are going to be any uh, better uh, disposed toward your book after they read the American review? Well, look, you have to be very charitable to reviewers. There are very unhappy people who have generally failed in an art form that they would have liked to excel in. So that, uh, especially in Canada, where uh, there isn't even any standards of reviewing, let alone creative enterprise, you have to be extremely gentle and tender and uh, pedagogical with reviewers. It doesn't do at all to be nasty at them, to, to fire off obscene telegrams as I occasionally do to them. I regret all these things because we really have to coddle them along and educate them. I'm not disturbed by anything any of the reviewers have said because I realize that I'm confronting an enormous ignorance as vast as our own country. Well, you've mentioned that you were a poet and are a poet, uh, in addition to being a writer of some prose. Indeed, this, this book itself uh, strikes me as being written as a form of poetry, but probably uh, you, you might disagree with this. Uh, do you find, though, that the outlet for a poet here in Canada is just as bad, or just as little, or just as lacking? This is a wonderful country to be a poet in, because it's uh, brutal, uh, indifferent, abusive. I mean, the worst thing possibly for a poet is a kind of warm uh, rec a recognition and a sense of belongingness. I mean, the very essential quality of being a writer, a good writer, is to feel just a little alienated from everything around you, and that way you can get a, a good perspective. So Canada is a marvelous country because everybody's alienated from everybody else, and it gives a wonderful uh, uh, edge to everything. You see, we're alienated from the French, the French from the Jews, Quebec from Canada, Westmount from Snowden, uh, St. Henry from uh, Cote St. Luke. The point is that there are wonderful alienated feelings thriving in this country. Everybody's unhappy, or if they're not unhappy, they're dull. So that it's a wonderful place to write in. Well, what role can the poet play in, the, in this type of a country? Can he simply reflect the alienation? Yes, and he can spread trouble everywhere. <laughs> And do you feel that this book is going to spread trouble everywhere? I is hope it's being spread, bought. It's, it, yeah, well, it's being bought, which uh, is very good for me, although I have a very bad royalty agreement with my publishers, but that's absolutely traditional for your first novel, to have a very bad ro royalty agreement. But beside that, I think the book is doing its bit to spread chaos and trouble and unhappiness. I wonder if you could uh, tell us something about how you got started on this uh, life of uh, spreading trouble and writing some excellent poetry. Well, I didn't think I was doing it, you see. I, 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 I grew up writing under a terrible illusion that this was the best and most manly thing a man could do, was to write. But I, I realize now, as I, uh, as I approach the end of my youth, 
I realized that that wasn't what it was about at all, that writers, uh, by their very nature, can't really be nice guys. Do people uh, shy away from you? I mean, I always party? thought that I was in a popularity contest when I wrote a poem, but I realized that, you know, nobody was voting. <laughs> that, uh, that they don't like you from the beginning. And that's good. That's good. I wouldn't like to have it any other way. I mean, I love, when I was reading in a nightclub downtown, one of the loveliest things that ever happened to me was being beat up a couple of times for the poems I read. And this, this is a warming experience. It, it lets you feel once again that nobody likes you. Now, your, your first book of poetry, which was published here, Let Us Compare Mythologies, was distributed on the McGill campus uh, yeah. for a dollar a copy, and now I understand it's going about seven fifty or so. How many copies do you have? I have two copies. That gives me $16. That's, uh, <laughs> yes, that a, was a wonderful enterprise. How did you become encouraged? Surely someone must have said to you, uh, Leonard Cohen, you have talent. Uh, keep it up. Must have happened. Oh, yes, because uh, I think that any artist... Um, has a kind of recognition that is most important to him, that is, of the five or ten minds in his country that he respects. And at any given time, for instance, uh, Melville is considered to have been a failure as a writer during his life, but he had the recognition of a man he admired, Hawthorne. And uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in a very, very creative atmosphere in, in Montreal. There were people like Irving Leighton, Frank Scott, Louis Dudek, all writing. And you know, phoning each other up in the middle of the night with manuscripts to depress one another. And uh, this was a wonderfully exhilarating kind of atmosphere to grow up in, and, and Montreal, for that reason, quite seriously, has been a wonderful place to, 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 to learn about the value of the craft of writing. Nobody's going to make a writer out of somebody who doesn't have the talent, but a lot of people who might have the talent are discouraged by the kind of brutal indifference that they're going to meet with in this city and in this country. But fortunately, there are a few fine and generous spirits in this city who will give a young man the value of writing. Well, thank you very much, Leonard Cohen. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, all of us, including all our viewers, will, of course, keep an eye on your career. And I think everyone will be very well advised to read Leonard Cohen's book, The Favorite Game. It's been a pleasure having thank you. Thank you very much.